Hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar today, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. My name is Karen Nomamoto. I'm the director of the UCLA Asian American Study Center. And I just, before turning it over to Robin Rodriguez, who will be our MC for today, I'd like to just begin with a land acknowledgement um, to acknowledge the Gabrielino and Tongva peoples as the traditional caretakers of Tovangar, the Los Angeles Basin and the South Channel Islands from which we're streaming today's program. And as a land grant institution, we pay our respects to the ancestors, the elders, and to all our relations, past, present, and emerging. Um, before we begin, I'd just like to announce the, uh, or acknowledge the co-sponsors for today's event. Um, I'd like to thank UC Santa Barbara's Asian American Studies Department, UC Davis, Bulasan Center for Philippinex Studies, UC Davis Asian American Studies, UC San Marcos Ethnic Studies Program, uh, the U University of San Diego Ethnic Studies Program, UCLA's Asian American Studies Department, and our Asian American Studies Center. So on that um, note, let me turn it over to Robin. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you might be. Uh, my name is Robin Rodriguez, and currently I am a professor of Asian American Studies at UC Davis, and I am the founding director for uh, the Bulosan uh, Center for Philippinex Studies. Um, I just have to kind of transition a little bit here. <laughs> Apologies, everybody. We're having some technical difficulties on the back end here. Uh, you would think that after a couple of years of Zoom, it should just be natural, but it's not that natural, actually. And the technology doesn't always work for us. So even when we're so accustomed to it. Um, but again, thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, I want to, um, so Hi, today, Eddie. what we're going to do is, um, hey, hey, Eddie, it's I, um, from UCLA Asian American. Oh, apologies, just a second, sorry, uh, just a moment. <laughs> okay, I think we're good now, sorry. I uh, was getting a little distracted from other um, sound in the background, but again, thank you all for joining us. Now today, today's webinar, it kicks off a series of webinars organized around our new book, Asian American, um, Contemporary Asian American Activism, Building Movements for Liberation. Now, in the struggles for prison abolition, global anti-imperialism, immigrant rights, affordable housing, environmental justice, fair labor, and more, 21st century Asian American activists are speaking out and standing up to systems of oppression, though our activism and organizing is often invisibilized. Bringing together grassroots organizers and scholar activists, our contributors in this book, um, demonstrate that emancipatory futures require collective action and reciprocal relationships that are nurtured over time and forged through cross-racial solidarity and intergenerational connections. Our contributors present lived experiences of the fight for transformative justice and offer lessons to ensure the longevity and sustainability of organizing. In the face of imperialism, white supremacy, racial capitalism, heteropatriarchy, ableism, and more, our contributors celebrate victories and assess failures, reflect on the trials of activist life, critically examine long-term movement building, and inspire continued mobilization for coming generations. Now, today's webinar is one of four, as I said, and it's focused on the very first section of the book. And before I, we dive into this first section of the book, I want to just quickly go over what our agenda will be for today's uh, webinar. First, I'm going to provide an overarching overview of the entire book. I, I kind of provided you just a little bit of a snippet earlier, but I'll dive a little uh, deeper into um, kind of an overview of the book. Then uh, I'll turn it over to our contributors, specifically the contributors of section one, which is entitled Incarcerations, Displacements and Transformations. And what they'll do is uh, provide self introductions and brief overviews of their chapters. And then I will lead a moderated discussion around several key questions. Then after the moderated discussion, I will open up the floor 
uh, hopefully to all of you for your questions. Um, again, you know, of course, some of us have been transitioning to in-person things, um, and many of us are still on Zoom, but uh, just to refresh everybody's uh, memories, we're doing this in a webinar format. So please try to post your questions, specifically your questions um, through that question uh, feature. Um, don't put it into the chat uh, because it'll be much easier for us to pick up on your question when you use the QA feature uh, that comes up for uh, webinar, um, the webinar version of Zoom. Okay, so hopefully that, that's clear for, for everybody. Um, Again, I've touched just a little bit about uh, what the book is um, about, but I want to offer some more background. Uh, first, I just want to speak about the, um, the this our collaboration. So, this is a book that I helped I co-edited with Dr. Diane Fugino, who wasn't who isn't able to join us today. Dr. Diane Fugino is a professor of Asian American Studies at UC Santa Barbara. Not only is she my collaborator for this book, she was actually my mentor and professor when I was an undergraduate at um, UC Santa Barbara. I think I may well have been um, in her very first class in Asian American studies, the very first class she was teaching at UC Santa Barbara. I was in my uh, final year there and uh, it was really Diane, frankly, who set me on this path to scholar activism. Had she not embodied um, the kind of educator and activist I wanted to be in the world, I don't know where I would be today. She embodied a model that I really wanted to aspire to. So uh, Diane and I uh, have been since our time together as uh, not only a professor and student, but even as uh, co-organizers, uh, we worked also as uh, colleagues in a space we created together at Santa Barbara. Uh, but since that time, we connect, continue to connect. And one of the things Diane and I ha have been wanting to do uh, for a while uh, was to really do the work of lifting up Asian American activism, Asian American activism scholarship, but also the perspectives and the knowledges of Asian American activists. So uh, the 50th anniversary of ethnic studies uh, and of course, Asian American studies, which uh, not only, you know, the 50th anniversary of Asian American studies didn't just mark the 50th anniversary of a creation of our field of study, but it also marked the high point or the beginnings really of the Asian American movement. So for Diane and I, we really felt that it was important to do this work of um, coming together and, uh, and putting out some publications commemorating the 50th anniversary uh, with a view of, on one hand, really um, uh, showcasing scholarship on Asian American activism, uh, while also showcasing, again, the knowledges of Asian American um, activists. Because one of the things we both noted is that despite the fact that Asian American studies was created through struggle, created through activism, um, and despite the fact that some of our earliest courses were actually taught uh, not by scholars who had been trained in, 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 uh, in doctoral programs, but by on the ground organizers, despite all of that history, um, the field of Asian American studies has, has um, depended less on uh, the knowledges and insights and analysis of on the ground organizers and more um, on professionally trained uh, scholars. And so Diane and I both wanted to, to uh, showcase the scholarship because it's still really great, important work, research being done by our colleagues while also bringing to the center um, activists and organizer knowledges. So, um, uh, we did this in two ways. So actually, one of the things we did, and, and we owe, um, we, we got a lot of support from Karen, um, was that we did a special issue for Amerasia Journal. Uh, and I think the link, link should be put in your, the chat soon. But uh, we did a special issue on Asian American activism in Amerasia Journal. And in that uh, journal is where we really showcase some of the new scholarship on different uh, forms of activism. But it's in this book 
that we, again, we, we, we did the work of actually trying to not only have the perspectives of, of activists or scholars, but we privilege in particular scholar activists, people who think of themselves as community engaged scholars or scholars who came out of um, social justice movements or are, are continuing to be part, uh, active in social justice movements. But we also wanted to um, uh, feature uh, the expertise of on the ground organizers across uh, different generations of Asian American activism and involved in different kind of uh, Asian American organizations. So um, that's something that uh, that we do that's very distinctive about this book. And um, you know, it, despite the fact that we have a title that that, that um, our title is Contemporary Asian American Activism. Uh, one thing that we also do that's somewhat distinctive in this book is that we offer this intergenerational lens on Asian, on contemporary Asian American activism. Something that we state in the intro to the book is this, quote, Asian American activism today cannot be understood without tracing its roots to the Asian American movement. <clears throat> Excuse me. Intergenerational continuity is not necessarily a given. Most Asian American movement activists in the late 1960s were isolated from the earlier genealogy of Filipino American, Korean American, Chinese American, and Japanese American struggles, end quote. So what we really wanted to do here in this book is to, to showcase the ways that this Asian American movement of the late 1960s and 70s has continued to have an afterlife that um, whether it was because of the, uh, the, the active role that Asian American movement activists played in mentoring uh, succeeding generations, or whether uh, certain ideas that animated the activisms of the late 1960s continue to animate our organizing today, it was really important for us to trace this genealogy. Now, among the, the important lessons from Asian, the Asian American movement that we believe continue to be relevant to Asian American organizing today, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I'm getting really excited here, but among the key lessons from the Asian American movement that we think are relevant uh, is one, political education, two, radical love, relationship, uh, and community building, as well as collective leadership. Three is radicalism. Four, cross-racial solidarity. And five, internationalism. So these are lessons that we think that the Asian American movement offered to us that actually we think um, become a, the promise for future activism. And also we're among the lessons that continue to, uh, to, to ground how many, uh, many of the movements and uh, that we, many of the organizations that we, we showcase in, in this book. Um, again, the webinar series. So today we kick off a series of four webinars and in each of these four webinars, uh, webinars we're going to draw out these five key lessons um, across different issues, uh, organizations and movements. Today's webinar focuses on part one of the book, Incarcerations, Displacement and Transformations. And uh, with that, I'd like to turn to our contributors now to offer their short self introductions and chapter overviews. I'm, and I'm hoping that the tech worked and we're all here together um, because I have my windows uh, uh, minimized. Oh, there you are. Yay, Eddie. Woo, you're there. I was freaking out a little bit. It's so good to see you, Eddie. I wanted to actually start with you, Eddie. If you can go ahead um, and start uh, just a quick uh, introduction of you yourself, Eddie, and some of the points in your book. And I'll just state now that the uh, title for Eddie's chapter was Prison to Leadership Pipeline, Asian American Prisoner Activism. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Robin. Uh, happy new breath, everyone. Hello, Karen. A long time no see. Yeah, um, yeah I was very grateful to have this opportunity to you know, share this space and really sharing about uh, my contribution to this uh, book right here. Uh, but, but before that, you know, I think it's very relevant and related to uh, that we're having our kickoff today, you know, as uh, today is the 140th anniversary of the Chinese Exclusion Act. 
And so there's a series of uh, celebrations, I'm sure, across the nation right? or locally, people are doing uh, different things to commemorate um, this injustice that happened you know, 140 years ago. Um, so, so even just the, these type of commemorations is very relevant to the contemporary Asian American activism, right? And it's the people that who came together all the time, you know, when it, when it comes to fighting uh, for equity, fighting for liberation, it's about how we're gonna really document those type of movements and activism so we can continue to learn and grow and you know, strategize, right? Uh, as more um, challenges come into, um, you know, our daily lives. And so for, uh, for my specific chapter, you know, when we talk about activism, frequently we are not including uh, people that who are impacted by the criminal legal system, you know, specifically for many of the Asian American Pacific Islander community. And so uh, what I documented on, uh, in, within my, my chapter is really looking at how uh, historically there's not that many uh, activism or, uh, or um, just people or uh, movements that who started within the prison industrial complex by, uh, by Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. And so uh, the fact that I was able to uh, utilize uh, some of my lived experiences while I was incarcerated to be able to uplift the Asian prisoner support committee and its formation and that how it's been led into a, a movement right currently uh, it's very important because uh, as people as Robin was talking about earlier you know the need for political education uh, sometimes those type of education has to come from the belly of the beast right for the people that who are directly impacted so we have witnessed many of the um, elders and ancestors that who were uh, activists revolutionaries that who directly impacted in many ways and that they came out to be able to uh, fight not only for their own uh, personal liberation but for collective liberation of all people right in, in the sense of you know we have witnessed uh, many of the people that were in the black panthers party um and you know in, in different uh, groups of people of color communities that who just continue to having to uh, fight for their human rights uh, in this space so when it comes to the asian american pacific islanders and native hawaiians the impact of mass incarceration uh, is very detrimental uh, because not only of the fact that people are impacted but it's the fact that when people are impacted they're being invisibilized as a result of the model minority myth and many other factors that uh, do not really have any sort of culturally competent resources to support uh, those impacted individuals and communities. And so the chapter really uh, kind of like a paint a picture of how uh, individuals that who are in, in the prison uh, were able to one, get educated and then became critical thinkers and then later on to be able to um, fought for ethnic studies, right? As a way to just be more uh, inclusive in our learning by focusing on the importance of learning our own culture and history and then learning about other people's culture and history. And that has been very consistent with the activism that was done in the Third World Liberation uh, Movement in 1968 in San Francisco State University. And then from those type of learnings, then we were able to really try to advocate for ourselves to be included in those learning environments, even within the prison system, to be able to be represented, right? However, you know, it was proven by the fact that how the administration was able to crack down on people who were incarcerated, trying to uh, demand uh, for their human rights and also uh, their opportunity of learning, uh, their, their action was to you know, put us into solitary confinement and as a result of that, that's how, uh, you know, the ancestor like Yuri Kochiyama and many of the young students who came together uh, and advocated uh, for the prisoners, like myself and, and two of my friends, uh, Mike Mo and Rigo uh, Remedio, uh, who, who were all thrown into solitary confinement as a result of signing the proposal. 
and therefore, uh, because of those uh, people that who activated uh, on the outside in response to the people who were, who were really, um, the, you know, ready to challenge uh, an oppressive system, then it started a movement that is, was very unintentional uh, in many ways, but it's a much needed movement that need to be started uh, from, from within the prison system. And so that kind of highlighted the fact how we can look at the Southeast Asian uh, deportation, uh, especially the Cambodian uh, refugees that were directly impacted as a result of the US foreign policy. We looked at how uh, people are organizing on the street in uh, direct relationship with the people who, who are impacted inside. And they eventually be able to create a, a movement where people are really advocating the support uh, of the currently and formerly incarcerated individual and people who are impacted by uh, deportation. And that kind of journey, you know, just take us into uh, the, the importance of, uh, as we look at activism and, and in the community, or, or we call it in the free world, how do we also look at activism as being uh, taking place uh, in different uh, uh, societies and different community and environments that sometimes we may not uh, be as inclusive as we should have. So please uh, check out the ch chapter and, and look at how the connection, uh, you know, that the chapter is kind of like be as a part of this uh, fluid puzzle with the, the contemporary Asian American uh, activism uh, building movements for liberation. Thank you so much for that, Eddie. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, our next speaker is Karen Umamoto. And Karen um, uh, has her, the title of Karen's chapter is Ho'oponomamo and Restorative Practices Reflections on Scholar Activism in Juvenile Justice, Justice Change uh, Systems Change. And I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. Uh, Karen, I think you wanted to start off with a video. Um, maybe I'll end it with a video. Can you hear me? Sounds okay. great. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Uh, uh -huh. just, just a short video clip, um, but but thank you. And it was really an honor and a privilege to be included in this book project. And I really thank Diane and Robin for your leadership and, and for um, for facilitating such a wonderful process with a symposium and, and writing sessions and everything. Um, so um, I just a little bit about me. I became active. Um, as I took my first Asian American studies class uh, in the mid 1970s from the people who actually fought for ethnic studies because we didn't have ethnic studies professors then, right? People were teaching from the community and from, from um, uh, you know, places of activism at the beginning. And um, it was so effective that I quit UCLA after my freshman year, became a full-time community organizer and joined the um, fight against gentrification in Little Tokyo, Los Angeles, and ended up um, bouncing around and eventually uh, finishing at SF State. And um, there really diving deep into Asian American studies and really trying to figure out like, where does, where does what we learn in school con connect with activism, right, in, on the ground in the community. So for the past 25 years, I've been a professor um, in urban planning. And it's um, kind of ironic because we are fighting against urban planners and urban planning um, when we are fighting evictions um, in Little Tokyo. And then to become uh, an urban planner was really to try to figure out how planning can, can create social change for the better um, for the people rather than for developers and, and others' um, money, money, moneyed interests. So um, this chapter that I wrote was really focusing on the past um, 10 years of work with folks in Hawaii where I spent 22 years of my career um, at the University of Hawaii working uh, primarily with Hawaiian communities. And um, of course, you probably know that overrepresentation um, of Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders uh, in Hawaii is part of the legacy of colonialism and reality of settler colonialism today. And so part of kind of the movements for self-determination and um, building Lahui or nation building um, has been to um, throughout all aspects of, of life in Hawaii, um, led by 
um, Native Hawaiians has been uh, included in that is um, justice reform. So I think as an activist scholar, um, what I try to do uh, is to chronicle the kind of work that we did in the juvenile justice system, um, not just myself, but from the perspective of a team of us who were really trying to push change, drive change, kind of push the envelope um, to make meaningful transformations. Um, and I think a lot of, a lot of us really um, have abolitionist um, dreams and aspirations. And I think the challenge is to figure out what is, what is going to replace the system that we have now. And so what I wanna do is just show this video clip that kind of highlights um, the kinds of change that we, we were trying to make and still trying to make, I'm still very active there. Um, on a project to end youth incarceration, which we really see as realistic and on the near near horizon. Um, but what do we replace it with that's going to give youth, right, that space, that sovereign space to, to um, uh, deal with a lot of past trauma, connect with the community, um, and especially create spaces for people that, like we say, to be, to be Hawaiian. So let me share my screen and I think it's just, I'm gonna just share the last two minutes of a video that was put, um, was made by the Star Advertiser that I think um, captures the kind of transformation that youth have been able to achieve by um, being able to enjoy the benefits of Hawaiian-based, Aina-based, Ohana-based, family-based, um, programs and spaces. So let me just play the last two minutes. So in return, you guys come in here, work in this farm for the next guys to come, so they get something for you. Okay? Just like you pull weeds in here, you go pull weeds in your life. You guys got that? This is the moon. You have a polo moon that you need to empty out. Take all your feelings, what's happening in you. Talk to your counselors. Okay? The next week, you come home on a bono, all the weeds, we're going to throw them under the canvas. Then we're going to mix them in the ground. The last week, when you guys head out, we're going to plant. We're going to find out what you like to do out there. We're going to, yeah, the last week, you get to leave this place. And we're going to different places where you feel you can fit in the community and do something good. You understand? Yeah, once I expressed my feelings to them, I felt like really good. And just like the weight just straight left off my shoulders. So I felt like lighter and really like better than before. Cause I just used to be mad and down. I used to just didn't like care and if when I shared my thoughts to people they didn't really care about it like it's like opinion to them so like I learned from this program a lot because if you tell the truth and if you be truthful to each other you're gonna set you're gonna get set free and you're gonna be you're gonna think positive so when you be in the low E or the Mahalo and when you grow thing it's gonna grow successfully Oh, you know, it's been a long three weeks for all of us here, but, you know, I'm proud of all these men that I got to share this opportunity with, you know. Mahalo, Reke, Alohala. Mahalo, Reke, Alohala. I thought I lost you at one point. I can thank the staff that I got my son back. I love you, man. Thank you. So that's just a little glimpse. I think it's hard to explain something like this, the kind of space that can be created um, from a native perspective and, and epistemology and knowledge system and how transformative that can be. Um, the current effort that I'm um, involved in or that we continue to grow is the um, effort to end youth incarceration by developing what's called Kavai Loa. And it's, um, uh, transforming the single youth um, detention or penitentiary or prison um, into an ecosystem of, of culture-based uh, Hawaiian-based programs and services and, and um, connections and relationships. So let me end it here. Ray, thank you so much.
much, uh, Karen. Uh, now, our, our third speaker actually was not able to join us. She got a flat tire on her way to the office this morning um, and is unable to join us. But I did want to still speak a little bit about her contribution to the anthology. We were uh, to be joined by Angelica Cabate and uh, her contribution to the book was a chapter entitled The Streets of Soma, Building Community Amid Displacement in San Francisco. Um, thank you so much. Uh, the, it, her bio has been um, put in the chat. And um, in addition to her bio, you'll also see the link to the South of Market uh, Community Action Network or SOMCAN as well as a link to a webinar um, that she did uh, for me through a different initiative. So if you're interested in diving deeper into the work that Angelica does, uh, you, uh, those resources are there for you. I do want to state um, that in the book, we list uh, her as um, Angelica as a author, along with Catherine Nassal. And Catherine Nassal is uh, was also very much an organizer, is still uh, an organizer. Um, she is one of my graduates, one of my graduate students. She's a PhD candidate currently in cultural studies at UC Davis and uh, has been part of a number of uh, activist and community organizing spaces, including most notably uh, recently, she helped to organize FIERCE, the FIERCE Coalition, which uh, FIERCE stands for the Philippine X Igniting Engagement for Reimagining Collective Empowerment, no, um, which is a statewide assembly of 20 Filipino American community based organizations, nonprofits, uh, and grassroots, and student groups. Now, um, what we did that was, I think, very novel uh, in, in our anthology is, especially for our organizers, we, we re realized that. Uh, First of all, writing can be such a daunting task, even for those of us for whom writing is our job, even myself as, as a researcher, as a scholar, it's always hard to write. Right? Is, writing is not easy. It can sometimes be especially uh, daunting for folks who, for whom this is not their job to kind of write and um, on a regular basis. And um, of course, there's also just the issue of time. So many of our organizers uh, are on the ground, just busy in their the day to day of, of their work. So uh, what uh, Diane and I tried to do when we convened all of the contributors was to create space to give them the spaciousness uh, to write. So some of the, the very first drafts for the book were, were done at Santa Barbara. Um, to, uh, collectively, uh, it was a really, uh, you know, just a peaceful, uh, relaxing space for us to be able to, to begin the writing process with each other. And then following um, that initial uh, convening, uh, we assigned graduate students uh, to uh, assist our organizers in the writing of their chapters. Um, you know, we know that organizers are constantly thinking and analyzing um, the world as and the, the social structures that shape um, the issues that they encounter. And so we had our graduate students do some listening of, as, as uh, folks talked about the work that they did helping to kind of structure and organize their chapters. And so just, I think that was an important thing to just lift up um, in terms of uh, why we have these uh, kind of co-authored co co uh, pieces in, in the book. Now, I wanna turn to the moderated questions and they actually do come from Catherine. Catherine helped to come up with a few questions that I was uh, that I'm going to pose to both Karen and Eddie, um, and since uh, Angelica can't join us for today, so Karen, Eddie, if you're if you're ready, uh, one of the questions that Karen, uh, or I'm sorry, that Catherine uh, posed is this: Throughout each of your chapters, you shared how you navigated experiences of immense violence from the state and private industries, whether it be the carceral system, the collusion of housing developers and local governments to the incarceration of native peoples on their own lands. Yet amidst such violence, uh, you develop new practices of healing and community building, such as ethnic studies, participatory urban planning and restoration. And what do these practices of community building and healing look like 
now in your organizing? How have the seeds you planted years ago grown? Either of you wanting to take that question. Eddie, do you want to go? Uh, go ahead, Karen. You should, you should go okay. first. Okay. Thank you. Um, one of the things that, uh, and I, I just want to be clear, though, I, I, you know, as a scholar activist, you always try to figure out, like, where you can be of most service. I mean, I think that's the constant question. Where can I be of most service? Where can this position as a professor, right, with a certain amount of, 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 of resources, um, training and things like that, how, how can that be of service? So, um, so I think as a planner, um, it, it, was a, it was wonderful to figure out how, how it is that we can strategize change. And when you talk about violence and, and the structure, the structure imposes a certain set of incentives and interests. So one of the biggest challenges to any kind of justice reform are the prison unions. And Eddie's probably very familiar with this. The prison unions, especially in California, are one of the biggest, strongest unions in the country, you know, in, in, in that kind of landscape. And so anytime you're talking about um, shifting, right, from a punitive system to a restorative system, you're talking about replacing right, prison guards with, with social workers, community organizers, and um, elders and, and others who, who um, and, and that kind of change instills a lot of fear and resistance. So I think that's one of the biggest challenges. So when you try to do abolition work, we, we kind of um, concluded that it's really a head, heart, and na'au in Hawaii. It's called na'au. That's kind of your gut. That's where kind of your you know, wisdom resides. And, and so everything that we did tried to change head, heads, hearts, and souls. Um, and so when I see, mean souls, like really trying to reach people at that kind of deep spiritual level. So we talked about policies, paradigms, and people is another way that we talked about this, right? We have to change the way people think. We have to change the logic, like these logics, dominant logics about behavior modification, that punishment is something, you know, like carrots and sticks, like we're rats in a maze where you use carrots and sticks to shape behavior. That's like a leading paradigm that's still dominant today. We have to change that paradigm to one of healing. And so that's one of the areas that we did a lot of training and education and workshops and things around. Um, people in terms of behavior, even the people in the system who, who agreed with us, right, who wanted to change, um, there was a big difference between people in the justice system who are trained as social workers and those trained in, trained in criminal justice. And the social workers, of course, tended to be to take to that kind of healing approach much more readily than than those trained in criminal justice. But even with the social workers, it, there tended to be kind of this missionary kind of approach, which is kind of that, that whole legacy, right, of of colonialism and and um, and religious domination as well. So I think there are so that so so those kinds of discussions and exchanges and transformations were important, and then the actual changes in policies. Like if you could like move on all three fronts, you know what I mean, and and you kind of use one like almost like going scaling a mountain, right? There's like you 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 put one python in and then another python and. And that sets it and then you get to the next thing. So we're pushing on these policy paradigms and people fronts um, all at the same time. And I think we've made, um, and that's allowed for us to like pass legislation that actually acknowledges now, like not just Hawaii Youth Correctional Facility, but the whole seven, I don't know, couple, several hundred acres called, is now called Kauai Loa Youth and Family Wellness Center. And so we want to, we're literally surrounding, right, the prison um, with the leadership of um, Mark Patterson, who's the administrator, and um, Sean Kanaya Puni, who's the head of um, Partners in Development and, and other organizations, 
to surround it, right? Surround the prison literally with all of these programs, similar to the one you saw in the video, and then eventually, right, shift the pathway away from the prison to this whole ecosystem called Kavailoa. So, so anyway, that's kind of the way that we're tackling violence, right? By really trying to, yeah, figure out how to make those kinds of changes, pin those changes down and then make more changes. Eddie, did you wanna tackle that question? If not, we could also go to the next one. I could also offer something as well. Yeah, I, I, I just wanna say that, you know, for, you know, for me, I, I've really witnessed like this uh, empowerment, right? Do the, do um, just having an opportunity for people that were directly impacted inside to learn about their own culture and history, right? It's through that process, you know, when, when um, you know, with some of the prisoners who were inside, you know, some of the, the API prisoners inside, and we, we created the Roots program, right? Which is the restoring, uh, restoring our original true selves. And that's, that's what, uh, you know, the, the co-founder of Roots that who were inside, I really focus on how do they, uh, get a better understanding of who, who, why they uh, inflicted those harm and you know, what, why they make those type of decisions and then to find ways to touch, it's like touch their roots, you know, their core of value, right? As, as a human being and as also as uh, people that who, have inflicted harm and trying to find way to have a better, gain better understanding about the trauma that they have experienced and how, how it has those huge intergenerational impacts as a res result of, you know, for many of the Southeast Asian um, populations, it's like the US foreign policy, you know, when it comes to dealing the, the war in Southeast Asia in many ways. So just watching the, the Roots program uh, grow in a way that heals people just through uh, learning, right? through exposure uh, to uh, information and uh, literatures and history that they normally are not being taught in the institution of uh, education. That's empowering, right? And then the result, you know, having the Asian Prisoner Support Committee was formed and then also continue to build uh, it, it created a movement, so that's why you have we have witnessed, you know, the, the anti-deportation uh, campaign that the Asian Prison Support Committee was able to uh, help more than thirty individuals to gain their freedom, right? Uh, whether it's through uh, advocacy, to uh, pardon campaigns, you know, they also uh, focus on right now. You know, one of the things that we've seen how uh, many of the directly impacted individuals who uh, who came home. And they were able to pay it forward by do you know either uh, in organization that were led by a direct impacted individual, and then still continue to fight, uh, you know, to push policy to stop the double punishment of the, the direct transfer from state prison to ICE, like uh, immigration customs informants custodies. You know, so in California, it's definitely pushing the Vision Act. Right, last year it passed the assembly, but then it didn't, the Senate didn't get to. Uh, look at it this year, they're continuing to pushing that. That's correspondence courses, right, with the uh, women prisons, uh, in women prisons, you know, how to engage people when we talked about uh, political education earlier, right? It's, it's like, how do we, you know, even engage a population that is visibilized in many ways by mainstream society, and then also with the, within the AAPI community, right? Uh, so the, because of the culture shame uh, factor uh, in that way. So seeing, seeing all this uh, just kind of like uh, nurture, this growth, and then and this uh, direct connections with the people is all as a result of uh, people that who are building relationship and building trust and to be able to uh, create spaces where people can uh, at least have the, the culturally competent the resources and support that they need to engage this uh, healing journey together.
Thank you for that, Eddie. It's it's um it's really interesting, of course, you know, for both Karen and I were both educators. Uh, and it's wonderful that UCLA is taking this uh this um uh, is leading this initiative on this Asian American digital textbook um, that uh, that educators in the K through 12 system can also use. And so it's interesting to kind of hear you, Eddie, talk about how um, kind of Asian American or ethnic studies education is uh, um, it was is 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 sort of the marked sort of the beginning of a healing process for for uh, many of the folks you work with. I just want to add, you know, I think that. Um, one of the things that I'm particularly uh, in, involved in, and in, in, uh, in partnership with um, other BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color organizers, uh, organizers across the country, is uh, this work of advancing healing justice, uh, specifically healing justice uh, programs within uh, community organizing spaces. And that is that, you know, so much of what we experience in our work as organizers and activists is we, we, uh, we do hold the collective trauma of our communities. And um, it can be really hard and challenging. You know, oftentimes uh, people who work in nonprofit spaces, community organizing spaces, um, get very spent and burnt out. And so we are launching a, an initial cohort of folks uh, to gather them together, uh, to offer up some, um, to share some resources um, on various kinds of healing uh, practice uh, that we can use for ourselves uh, individually, but also that we might help uh, be able to introduce into the organizational cultures of the groups we work with. And so that's something that we're, um, at least I've been trying to be, uh, that I'm part of. Now, um, I know we only have about 10 minutes left. Um, so we did have a secondary question and uh, it looks like we don't yet have any questions from the audience, but please uh, folks in the audience, if you have them, uh, post them. But the other question that Catherine poses, especially of course, this is Asian American History Month or Heritage Month, different people referring <laughs> to it in different ways, but with our community still experiencing displacement, incarceration, the colonialism, what is the state of our movement? What does it what what does the state of our movement look like and um, now and where Eddie, why don't you go first this time? Sure. Uh, thank you, Karen. Um, it, you know, when, it's good to be reminded, you know, even though it's, uh, it's like, it's, it's, like it's, it's AAP, uh, NHPI Heritage Month, uh, but it's good to be reminded that we, the contribution of our ancestors and, and the people who made to create a space of belonging, create a space of a home. But that has a value in this idea of when we are still looking at uh, perpetual foreigners, right? Conveniently, when, it, when it's convenient for the state or for the, you know, for, for the people in power uh, to use that as a, uh, scapegoat as a, a, a tool to weaponize in, in the separating people, uh, our racial solidarity with other people of color. I mean, I think those uh, having uh, this reminder that we belong here, right, that we have contributed uh, to every aspect of the growth of this country and we need to be recognized. And those histories, uh, the authentic histories Right, needs to be taught uh, in in our schools, right? In in do storytellings, and do our lived experiences, and so the state of our movement in a lot of ways, I think, is that the the urgency is a little different, right? And somehow uh, there's this push and pull in. Uh, at times, people we are being very reactionary. And at times, uh, people have been very innovative, you know, in in, in those uh, type of activism and fighting uh, for equity and fighting for safety, right? As we have witnessed on anti-Asian violence that continues to happen uh, in, in in across the country and across the globe uh, in many ways. And so, the the movement for me is we have 
the, the new leadership, right? The new generation of the leaders and activists and the people that uh, we all ask to be center, right? So it's like, how do we center the people who are directly impacted? And then also how do we elevate and create this leadership pipeline uh, for people to, you know, create their movement in their own terms, right? Uh, in this space. So that's, that li that's why this book is so important is because it captured the lineage of many of the act Asian American activism right, in, in our country, you know, locally and globally, and how, how we can make sure that as people are learning and growing, uh, do those type of uh, strategies and they create, it, create and then allow them to create their own strategy in this. And I think for us, uh, we, we have to be more, have more urgency in investing uh, in, the, in the movement building, right? And, and I just finished by saying that um, there is still a lack of uh, true uh, and authentic investment in building racial solidarity of other people of color, right? And, and this goes to both ways, right? Ways that how uh, we are continue to be pit against each other, but then because of the, the, the lack of resources and the scarcity mentality that is colonized and indoctrinated in, in people's minds and the movement's minds, uh, when, it keep, when it comes to issue-based uh, areas, a lot of times it's always trying to uh, break up, use that to break up our community, break up our, our solidarity. And so therefore I feel that we have to um, really, to have a better uh, in-depth you know, analysis of how these type of movements and where we're going are informed by the, the, not only the, uh, the ancestor that who paved the way, that who created those uh, a, a space so we can even have the possibility of even taking advantage of those sacrifices. And to be able to uh, be very critical Right, and not just be like uh, going like going with the trend, you know, in a way. So I think that's that, that's something that I I would love to hear more and explore more, you know, as as we uh, talk more around the, the movement. So I think we we need another symposium get together, you know, to con continue and broaden it and, and continue this conversation because I I don't think I could have said it better, you know, I. I, I totally agree with you. And I think that what Robin said at the beginning of this um, panel was uh, in terms of the purpose of the book, right, is to not lose the intergenerational wisdom and to create more exchange between young people, you know, young, young activists and, and, and people have been around for a long time, people with white hair like me. Um, I have a 24 Da, uh, year old daughter who's who's you know been an act, it got involved in student activism when when she went to school and um, I think that so so I, I replay a lot of the discussions and there's just so much rich richness right I learned so much from her and I hope she learned you know from me as well because I think there's there's a tendency to kind of reinvent the wheel sometimes when and make some of the same mistakes and some of the things that I worry about that I think we can have more discussion about is some of what Eddie said, you know, sometimes we're kind of issue oriented and we don't necessarily see how these issues fit into these broader set, a broader set of values and visions that tie us all together, both within the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities, as well as with other um, uh, people of color and, and progressives um, as we, you know, as we're taking on, you know, the immediate tasks at hand. The other is the idea of a united front, and that's related to this too. Um, we're not gonna agree with everybody on all things all the time, but sometimes I think people, you know, and I was one of them too, right? You kind of attack the people who you should be uniting with because in the bigger scheme of things, you know, you have more in common with them than you do with the people that, you know, are really causing a lot of pain and harm, right, in society. And I think that that idea of a united front was, something that we kind of took from kind of the internationalist struggles of the 1960s that I think kind of um, 
may have gotten lost, um, but that was really strong when people were talking about, you know, third world movements back then. And, and to see what, what, what building a united front means, how, what, it, what does it mean to stand side by side when you, on things that you, you, you can and, and, um, and then step back maybe when you don't agree, but not attack each other when you don't agree, right? Because then it's like cutting a pie into so many different um, pieces you know, on every issue that you don't have any basis for unity anymore. And that really weakens the movement. So I think there are lots of lessons like this um, that, we, that we can draw. And um, I, I really love what Robin's, uh, I, Robin, I really like the work that you're talking about because, you know, being involved for a long time is, is, is hard and so many people have sacrificed so much, you know, and, and I'm, I personally in a, in a very privileged position, you know, in, in my involvement with the things that I'm involved in. But I think to privilege, um, like um, Eddie said, the people who are most, you know, um, seriously affected, working, working class people, uh, people in the labor movement and other areas, I think is really important. Yeah, thank, thank you for making that connection, uh, Karen. I just want to quickly an, uh, answer the, one of the question uh, by, by Jane is that, you know, in, in regards of how to organize in, in the prison and jails and what are some of the specific challenges, we have to really understanding that the people who are inside live in a total institution that, who, who, uh, that de dehumanized them, right? And as a you know, vehicle for punishment and for profit. And so when you're organizing the, the, the people, you have to understand that uh, whatever that the administration does not want you to have or want you to have a voice, they will shut you down, right? So the challenge is that either they can create a longer, uh, give you more like time, you have to do more time inside, uh, or you know, there are ways that they can punish you that you can uh, lose your privileges and you know, on top of the rights you already lost. Uh, so that's, and so it's, it's very challenging in trying to organize uh, people inside. And so from that, uh, from the uh, administration, administration perspective, but just internally with, with, with the people inside, um, it, it is about building relationship and building trust also, right? In a, in a total institution, people are very distrust of each other. Um, you know, that's why you have tattoos. Everybody got trust no man, trust nobody in every, you know, every part of their body, you know? So trust is a huge uh, way to engage people and build a relationship to even have those type of dialogue about, you know, uh, uh, organizing and activism uh, inside. And then the other piece is uh, for people that who uh, engage uh, the people inside, when people talking about abolition, when people talking about how to free, uh, free them off, uh, free the people, uh, pe and going into to support the directly impacted individual. But it's, it's back to how do we center uh, those people that were directly impacted and your our goals going into the prison system to do any work is to free them, right? Literally, it's like free them, get them out of prison, right? And so part of that uh, is, is, is a process to navigate uh, with the administration and with the people that who are historically disenfranchised and don't have the necessary uh, critical thinking uh, that, that you know people would uh, expect. So it's about patience. It's about really like listening to what their needs are and how do we support them uh, based, based on, you know, this idea of freedom, you know, how do we free them? Right. Well, we're, thank you for that, Eddie. Uh, it makes sense that you have the last word. Um, you know, um, Karen mentioned, yes, you know, we can have yet another webinar to have some of these discussions and we will we have three more uh, that will cover different parts of the book uh, we won't be able to cover um, some of the specific issues that we deal with here however we will still uh, take up those themes of international of, of cross-racial solidarity of healing um, certainly uh, internationalism and many of the other lessons from the Asian American movement. We do have um, the webinar next Friday 
uh, taking place. So please, please register uh, for that webinar. Um, we uh, also will have a uh, in-person event, a book event in San Francisco, but we'll go ahead and send that out in the email since we're at 102 and I wanna honor everybody's time. But thank you, thank you to all of the UCLA Asian American um, Study Center staff for all the amazing work. Thank you too for your grace as we kind of had to manage some uh, minor technical difficulties at the very beginning. Thank you, Karen, for all of your leadership at the work there. Eddie, of course, for everything that you do. Um, so you all in the coming week. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Take care.